Welcome to Vision's webinar number eight. Welcome to all enthusiasts on sustainable energy, on bioenergy, or people interested in local action in Latin America, and all um, who would like to learn more about biodigestion experiences made in Latin America and the Caribbean over the last decade. Over the time, I think more and more will join, so we will start now. So the official um, title is Development and Application of Biodigested Technology Advances from Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, we are quite glad to realize this webinar um, on the topic as we have planned it for some time and we see really big potential of bioenergy in Latin America. But let me start with, um, with a short overview of the webinar structure and some housekeeping aspects. So after a short introduction from my side, we would like to know who you are, who is joining us today. So uh, we will have a short poll to ask where you are located and your field of activity. Um, then we have our very competent three experts and they will give us today short insights into their work with biodigesters and to the work of uh, the network of uh, Red Biolac, the network of biodigestion in Latin America and Caribbean. We have with us for this today Mariela Pino, the general coordinator since many years of the network Red Biolac, and she can give us um, an overview of the network and its um, activities, which are several, I can already tell you. And as second speaker, we are very happy to have Jaime Marti Herrero, who is since almost 20 years a key expert on biodigestion with experiences in various contexts and development um, of innovations. So he will give us an overview of various uh, technology advances that we could witness in the last um, years. And last but not least, we have Sam Schlesinger from Green Empowerment with us, who is uh, the Ecuador Program Manager. Uh, Green Empowerment has been founder of the network as, and is since then supervising the network and acting as secretariat. Sam will showcase remarkable features of, of the dissemination dynamics in the region, uh, but more about this um, when it's his turn. So after um, the three presentations, uh, we will have another two content-related polls. My colleague Willington, who has accompanied the network since its beginning, uh, will then act as a thematic discussion. So he will start a first round of questions, uh, while in the second round we will also consider the questions from the audience. So I come back to you. So it's quite important that during the presentations uh, that will each last around eight minutes, you can directly ask the questions in the chat window and we will include them um, in the discussion round at the end. So we hope we can include all of them, um, but in case we cannot, we will answer them after, afterwards. Um, so we, uh, we all know uh, that we are in a climate emergency and have recently seen that uh, we cannot wait for the action at, at global level. Um, and this is where Visions and its activities um, join in the, um, the things that we did for the last 15 years. We focus since our start on small scale sustainable energy solutions. And as we could witness um, that single project uh, solutions um, are not enough, we also intend to empower the practitioners, individuals and, and communities and see as key elements um, the close cooperation with uh, energy practitioners on the ground, but especially um, practitioner networks. So this is why we have been cooperating since 10 years with the Red Biolac and um, are very happy uh, to have this opportunity to present all the experiences made um, in this field. There have been several innovations, especially um, considering agricultural appliances in the region. But I do not want to tell too many things now and, and um, want to start with the, with the webinar. So we start now with um, the poll, the first poll, where we ask you from which reason, uh, region you are now um, joining us. So are you in the Americas, 
Are you located in Europe, Africa, Middle East, South Asia, or Asia? So I would like to ask you to click the right button. Yeah, I see more coming in. So we wait another few seconds and have now the results that you can also see. Um, so yeah, a high share is coming. Uh, so 36% from Africa and Middle East. The Americas and Europe are there with uh, a bit less than 20% and South Asia. So it's quite diverse. Um, and we are happy to have such a broad variety of regions included. A second uh, question we would like to ask um, your background and um, in which field you are currently employed. So are you uh, working for an NGO, private sector, are you with government, research, academia or other? Um, yeah, so we see that people click and uh, we're happy if you click more <laughs> so that all of you click the right button. And yes, I think we are all, um, most of you answered. So thank you for this. Um, the results we have is that, yeah, interesting, a high share. So 38% um, is from academia. Um, we have NGO and private sector, around 15%, 8% government, and a lot of other. So I think a variety of interests and different aspects, and I hope we can address all these aspects in the, um, the next hour. So I would like now to hand over to um, Mariella. Um, Mariella, um, has long-term working experiences um, with biogas in various contexts. Uh, she, was, she has been working in Mexico, Chile, where she's um, located currently, Vietnam, Cambodia. Um, and she's got a background as agricultural engineer from Chile and also did a, um, a further master in um, Germany. Um, I do not want to uh, way too long and now just hand over now to Mariella and um, like to ask if you're online, if you're there. Are you, do you hear me? Now, can you hear me, uh, Carmen? Yeah, great. Sorry for this delay. So go ahead, please. Welcome, Mariela. Hey, thank you very much, Carmen, and on all the equipment be be behind <laughs> the scene for organizing this webinar. Um, do you already see my presentation? As well? Yes, we see. Thank you. Great. So um, I'm glad to, to be able to present uh, to people outside of Latin America our work. Um, we have been working since uh, 2009, so it's now more than 10 years uh, that we have been putting together uh, a diverse group of organizations within Latin America. Um, our objective and our vision is that, um, sorry, I, I lost. Our vision of the of the world and Latin America in specific is that we have a resilient uh, region where the universal use of biodigesters contributes to a better quality of life. In order to reach that, we have set up a different uh, type of uh, objectives, which go on the line of promoting contact and collaboration, exchange information, lessons learned and experiences, identify and overcome technical, environmental, social and economic barriers, 
generate alliances which facilitate the adoption of the technology, propose projects, me mechanisms and ideas to disseminate the technology, and promote advocacy and influence policies related to biodigesters. How do we work in the fields and how do we reach the audience we want to reach? Um, we have different products and uh, activities which go in the line of the ones that you can see mentioned here. Many of them are online, but many of them as well are in-person activities along the whole continent, from Mexico until Patagonia. We have uh, most of the countries represented within our network with different organizations. Therefore, we all come together and we organize a yearly event and congress in diverse countries. We have reached now a number of 10 different countries organizing courses and workshops together with field visits. We have online and in-person training and we have a special um, purpose for next year, which we will explain a little bit later. We have an open library with technical, academic and educational documents, videos and webinars. And we also have a very special future to be de developed and deployed next year in the shape of a Biogas Latin American Wiki in Spanish. We have a students exchange among members. We, we boost um, that um, exchange and collaboration. We also have regular online conferences of experts. And we have noticed that the more technical and more specific the topic, the more audience we have. We have a Red Bio Lag magazine and booklets publications. And we have a mailing list for internal communication, so to say, within the engaged community of Biogas. We have a stronger and stronger social media and website for, for reaching um, the social universe, as we call. And we are specifically in, the, in these last years working on um, strengthening the working groups around specific topics for the engagement of different members. Therefore, we also have, as you could imagine, a very innovative organizational structure, which um, it's set up within a social universe of people that doesn't necessarily have uh, scientific or environmental backgrounds, but necessarily just have the interest in, in learning and approaching the anaerobic digestion technology, but also the practice of involving that, um, that uh, technology into, into the practice. Therefore, we organize ourselves in a um, coordination team, which is um, work doing the, the, the daily work, but together with the direction of the board of members and the honorary council, with the help and contribution of green empowerment and visions, of course. And lately, we have been including within that um, core, we have been involving the working groups and the working group leaders. As you can see, it's a very, um, it's, it's a not hierarchic uh, stru organizational structure. Therefore, we also understand the relevance of having a communication um, plan and skills so that we can bring out all of that information and possibilities out of the, of the core into the community of biogas and sustainability practitioners, which is um, many people um, in, in the public and, and, and private sector, uh, within academia, universities, uh, consultancies, uh, and so on. And um, from there, you can see we have been involving more and more each year, more people from the social universe. In order to do so, we have people from different countries of Latin America. Most of them are represented, as you can see in this table. We have uh, a board uh, at the moment, uh, compounded by six people, um, which is also um, working in the in the in the line of of the most of the of the regional founders of the network who are leading and, and like uh, guarding what uh, what is our initial initial spirit, and we have a coordination team, of course. So, um, our key message is, I would say. Um, it's the democratization and access to information and capacity building and focus on, on synergies. By bridging the gap of different words, we have learned that by mixing laboratory research, public and private sector, academia, NGOs experiences and practical research, we all grow and benefit from, the, from that experience in order to boost local empowerment. We also encourage practitioners 
to work and research on specific topics for a common goal throughout Latin America. We mostly focus on South-to-South -South collaboration, as we are the only ones that know better what's going on on our territories and what our capacity is. We won't create the wheel on, in each single corner of the continent, and that's why that was one of our first drivers when the network started more than 10 years ago, and we still have the same spirit. We are proud of promoting anaerobic digestion for treatment of organic residues, but no energy crops and nor, nor dioxin productions. At the moment, uh, the, the concept of uh, economic circular economy, it's, um, it's a very buzz word, but we are pretty much aware that uh, by promoting the most adequate practices around anaerobic digestion by not using energy crops, nor burning fossil fuels products for energy, energy production through that so-called waste to energy, we are aware of how important it is to promote really sustainable practices. And this means thinking in the future, take into consideration what we have in the world now, and how we can act as if future really matters. Regarding the the segment or maybe the, our um, objective, our target group, we have been at originally and initially mostly focusing on family farming. Um, because we know that those are the actors that are normally forgotten, um, but we can do a lot for the environment. Sorry, those th that segment of family farming can do a lot for the environment. But we are also aware of the current global needs and climate ambitions need industry commitment and deployment. And last but not least, we care of our increasing regional rate of urbanization. We started rural but went uh, dom uh, and domestic, but we added the urban challenges into our focus and proactive scales as well. So thank you for your attention. And we are, we are all inviting you to come to Peru next year for our yearly event. Great, thank you very much, Mariela, for this uh, short overview. I, I know that this is quite challenging, summarizing 10 years in uh, eight minutes, and we are all looking very much forward to the conference next year. I don't want to waste the time now and directly go to Jaime Martí. Jaime, are you, are you, can you hear us? Yes, hello, good oh, morning. Very good, good morning. Great. So I'd like to hand over and give the floor to you. Okay. Can you see the, um, the yes, presentation? Can. Right. Can. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good morning to everybody. Here is about eight o'clock in the morning. I am in Ecuador. Uh, my name, as, as has been told, is Jaime Martí. I have been working with biodigesters since 2001. And mainly, I have been working in Bolivia, uh, Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, in the South America continent. What I will try to show you is how, how is going the technology uh, of biogas bio here in Latin America. Uh, to begin, yes. um, first, we have to think, uh, I, 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 I am only going to talk about uh, low-cost digesters, only this kind of digesters that do not need uh, active or uh, heating or mixing devices. So the most famous ones in the world are this kind of digesters, the Fisip Dam, also called a Chinese uh, digester. I think uh, you know uh, about them more, uh, more than us, because they are very famous in Africa and, and Asia. They, they are known because uh, they are cheap, uh, they are installed only where you have the waste. Usually you don't transport the waste uh, from different places to one to one digester. Uh, what you do is to put the digester where you have the waste. And usually uh, you use locally the biogas and the, and the effort that, that you get. Uh, there are very big numbers for this kind of digesters, uh, more than 40 million units in China, around 5 million uh, digesters in India, three, 330 uh, 30, 
thousand in Nepal, and also in Africa there are also big numbers: uh, as Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Burkina Faso. But what about uh, Latin America? In Latin America, uh, there are just a very few, few, few number of these digesters. But we find in Latin America is other kind of digesters. In all Latin America, in all the countries, we find uh, we found that in the 70s and 80s, the, there were some installations of this kind of digesters, this is them, mainly Chinese digesters, but uh, there are no replication. Now it's very difficult to find someone installing this kind of uh, digesters in, in any country of the continent. And we think that the main problem is uh, is expensive. It's expensive because the the money you have to pay to the builder is, is expensive. It's a lot of money if we compare it with Africa or with Asia. So here in Latin America we had uh, one alternative to this kind of digesters that is called low-cost plastic, uh, plastic digester. This model was developed in the 80s, in the middle of the 80s. It was based in the Taiwanese model, the yeah, PVC Taiwanese digester, uh, and was adapted to a cheaper material. Uh, so instead of using PVC, uh, the proposal is to use greenhouse plastic. This is a typical, in, in the picture you can see a typical uh, tubular digester in tropical places. It's called tubular or plastic or balloon digester. It has uh, several names. It's, uh, also, it, it having got uh, active heating or mixing devices. It more water than the physical dump digester. It's one part of menu uh, by three parts of water. And as you can see, it's semi-buried. It's not uh, inside the ground. So what we can see in the plastic now is the uh, biogas bell. It's the place where the biogas is stored. This uh, design can be adapted to a very cold climate regions. We can work in regions with minus 5 degrees during the night, minus 10 degrees during the night. Has been uh, several digesters installed in over the 4,000 meters above sea level. So in very high uh, mountains or small villages in the mountains, what we get using this adaptation is uh, we, we reach a temperature inside the digester, inside the, the slurry, similar to the ambient, maximum ambient one. So if you are in a place where you have minus 5 degrees during the night, but during the day you get uh, 20 degrees, you can put your, your digester in 20 degrees working temperature. So this is mainly, this is uh, this kind of digesters, the two are ones, are mainly a Latin America proposal. But you can find also in Vietnam several of this kind of digester, several installations, uh, Perhaps one, two, three, five thousand digesters are installed in Vietnam. Uh, you can find in all the countries this kind of digesters, plastic ones, using greenhouse plastic. At the beginning, we well, used the, this uh, greenhouse plastic because it's very cheap. You can find it in any place in in Latin America, in any in any country. Also in the small village, is is easy to find it. Everything you need, you can you can buy it in the local market. But now we find that in several countries, there are small companies offering uh, geomembrane digesters. Uh, there are two kinds of bio, uh, geomembranes: could be PVC geomembrane or could be polyethylene geomembrane. Uh, why to use geomembrane? It is more expensive, but it, uh, the digester last for more time. It uh, can reach about 15 years working with no problem. When we think about tubular digesters, usually we are thinking in a small scale, scale but uh, as you see in the, in the picture, you can do very big uh, digesters using this design. 
This is, for example, 750, uh, uh, yes, 750 cubic meters uh, diet, diester, each of one. Um, they are treating wastewater from pigs. So, one other question is that you don't need the specialized uh, installers, you need the specialized uh, builders. It's easy to teach the people how to build this kind of digesters, uh, just doing three days working uh, workshops. Uh, all the materials are locally able, and um, usually we have been using also the biogas and the oil friend uh, locally, just inside the farm. But uh, this is the typical stove, you can <clears throat> adapt to biogas and just cook it, uh, to make uh, the lunch in the house. But what we, we are finding now is that uh, people is asking for more uses of biogas. So productive biogas is called. Yes, when did you use the biogas, for example here, just to uh, heat the small pigs, the baby pigs, or when you use the biogas here uh, to run a small uh, motor, a small generator. So this kind of uses of biogas is um, more and more popular now. There are some research here, for example, this is Peru, uh, on how to use the biogas to move some uh, farm machinery. And now we see that uh, there is a movement also um, to go out from the farm not only to treat uh, the, the menu, um, so to try to treat all the kind of organic, uh, organic matter like uh, wastewater treatment plants or organic solid urban waste, industrial waste. Some, just to go finishing, uh, some tips we find, we found that uh, for some cases when you work with uh, liquids, is better to divide the digester in, in several parts, just like a, 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 to work in series. No? Uh, we have found also that uh, if you put uh, bottles of soda, soda bottles inside the digester, uh, you can reach better biogas production, just uh, improving about 50% uh, the, the biogas production. When we say soda bottles, we are talking about this kind of bottles, pet bottles. You cut it and you put inside the digester, several uh, of them. And what we will have, uh, what, what is happening is that uh, the bacteria will go to, the, to, to these bottles, will colonize the bottles, so you will have more bacteria inside the digester to be producing biogas. We have been working also with uh, slaughterhouse wastewater, treating them in, in with biodigesters, a small experience and also big experience. Is one uh, each one of these digesters are uh, 100 cubic meters. It was a project uh, supported by Visions also. And now, for example, we are uh, working uh, with. Uh, a wastewater plant for residential uh, wastewater in the university with uh, by these uh, three digesters. Later, the, the wastewater go to a small uh, wetland and we are producing uh, biogas. So, as you see, you can use the, this kind of low cost technology, not only thinking in manure and in farm, also going to other, other conditions. Here, for example, is just a, it's not a tubular digester, but it's based on it's a, a special digester that is working with uh, organic waste from the, from the market. So uh, you can you can adapt and work in, in any condition. So just to be just to finish, uh, we have three materials to do this kind of the digesters: a greenhouse plastic. It is cheaper. Uh, it's easy to do it yourself. But it's delicate. Uh, you can use PVC geomembrane. Usually, it's prefabricated, so you just need one day to, uh, to do the installation in, in the farm. Uh, it's very flexi flexible. Uh, um, you can be working with it for 15 years with no problem, or you can use polyethylene geomembrane, prefabricated also. It also lasts for a lot of time, and it's more resistant. And you have uh, 
the three initi initiatives are working in parallel in all the in all the countries in, in Latin America. Usually, you will find also some uh, biogas reservoirs because we work with very low pressure in the biogas. So sometimes uh, the people want to store the, the biogas could be made with plastic or different kinds of reservoir biogas or big one reservoirs. Like, uh, this one is in polyethylene geomembrane. <laughs> And you can adapt, just one minute, you can adapt yes, uh, any stove Jaime. to, to um, the biogas. Yeah. Um, that's all. Just to ask you if you can come to an end, it's all very interesting. Yes, it's this is the last one, sorry. Okay. So finally, this technology is very cheap. Uh, it's cheaper than what we have found in with uh, Chinese digesters. It can be adapted to uh, cold climate regions. You have different materials, different costs, different, uh, different applications, different uses. Uh, can be made by yourself using greenhouse plastic or can be prefabricated, but uh, it lasts only one day to install one of these digesters. Now, the people here in Latin America is looking for productive uh, biogas. Uh, we are working also with wastewater and solids as substrates. And we have, we have some few research improvements, uh, getting 50% more biogas using bottles, for example. Um, one, one thing about this technology is not, it's not only from one country, it's, it's all around the, uh, Latin America. So we have a lot of networking, sharing all the research uh, and all the lessons learned. That's uh, the idea I wanted to, to point out uh, about the, the technology. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Jaime. This was um, really a good overview, and I know it's hard to keep um, the time. Um, so appreciate it. I would like to ask the audience once again, um, if you have questions, please uh, write them already now in the chat, and we will then consider them in the discussion round. Now I'd like to hand over to Sam Schlesinger from Green Empowerment, who's got um, a, a lot of experiences, several years in different countries like Costa Rica, Nicaragua and Ecuador uh, with um, the approach of holistic uh, project implementation, so experiences in different renewable energy technologies. Sam, are you there? I am. Very good. So I'd like hand over to you and you have got the floor and Jaime could you please switch off your mic thanks sorry fantastic hello everyone I do thank you all for being here today on this webinar at the various times that we have here so just briefly to repeat what Jaime had mentioned in terms of a, a baseline comparison between the Latin American region and the real big adopters in terms of biodigester technology. At a regional level, there are perhaps 640 million people in Latin America, but we're at only 15,000 digesters installed, so less than many African countries that have had national programs and versus the big adopters in India and China, similar population levels, one one hundredth or even one one thousandth of the total digesters. So we're trying to look a little bit through this presentation and what the precedents are and how we've gotten to this point and what different countries are doing in an effort to better promote the technology. The precedents throughout the region have been fairly similar throughout the 70s and 80s. Most countries had the introduction of fixed dome digesters, aren't generally supported through the German technical cooperation. And while the technology worked just fine, there was ignorance really of the social setting and of the economic setting around these. And many of these results in failure of the technology because there was no follow-up or of replication because there were not really the economic opportunities to repeat these digesters. This then became tubular digesters. They were in, brought about in the 1980s, 1990s. It was an oversimplification. The idea that anyone can install a digester after reading a manual led to a wide number of pilot projects but without any articulation and with a lot of failures both from technical and from social aspects. In recognition of these issues, there was the bringing in of new technology, like the geomembrane that Jaime uh, explained, but also the idea of linking actors through the Red BioLAC and through national level networks. And over the last decade, there have been efforts to really replicate digesters throughout different countries, looking at different strategies, looking at different ways of trying to massify the technology and get the region 
up to par with what other countries in the world are at. So we're going to look at country level experiences running from the most grassroots to the most uh, driven by outside actors. So first, Colombia. Colombia, driven through the introduction of tubular digesters in the 1980s, has really had a constant promotion of the technology, has really had the, the longest experience with organizations that have been pushing for the democratization of knowledge about this technology and has been able to create a wide variety of grassroots uh, actors, both indigenous organizations, smallholders organizations, with local capacity to really replicate the technology. They've formed a national level network, the Red Bio Coal, which extends beyond just biodigesters to take in bioenergy, so brings in a wider variety of actors and really brings academia to help solve problems defined from the field. And finally, they've really had a, a consistent push towards trying to get um, towards trying to get the technology spread throughout the country without any government support. This has been the motivation a little bit for the Ecuadorian network. So over the last three years, with some outside support, we've been able to form a national level network here in Ecuador that's really focused on hands-on training, on the idea that bringing together academic and smallholder actors to learn how to install digesters, as Jaime mentioned, something you can do over a period of two or three days, and really get this knowledge spread to the people who can implement in the field. Unfortunately, we haven't really seen a critical mass met yet. People have the knowledge, but financial limitations and cultural limitations, as well as the need to compete with subsidized LPG, have really limited the spread of the technology throughout Ecuador. With a much more business-driven approach, much more, uh, uh, sorry, a much more market driven approach has been Costa Rica. So, with an anchor institution at Earth University, which is training 100 more students a year on biodigester technology, several graduates have left the university and begun small businesses that have helped push for digester implementation in the country. They're helped along by a strong national uh, framework, a strong level of environmental controls, especially on runoff and pollution from small farms and medium-sized farms. So there's been a push to adapt biodigester technology, not specifically targeted towards digesters, but targeted towards the sanitation abilities of the digesters. However, while various ministries, various projects have pushed for digester implementation in Costa Rica, there's been a lack of articulation perhaps between actors, and so they haven't really um, been able to follow up on these digesters or link these digesters into a framework built on monitoring or into something that might be able to be called a national level plan. Also coming from a, a business focus is the experience in Mexico where really a single business, Sistema Bio Bolsa, has been able to reach almost national level program impacts without any strong government um, assistance, without any strong regulatory framework but with a lot of support from international actors. They've been able to combine implementation of mid-sized biodigesters for at using market-based strategies with smaller digesters that are subsidized through programs. These international programs have also been able to support a very novel series of educational workshops, not only targeting uh, potential clients, but also targeting school children, targeting other people so that biodigesters become much more of a day-to-day -day phenomenon, so that it's not at all unusual to see a biodigester. And to include this in curriculum as a way to get people from the various earliest ages interested. Something that we've seen um, also used in Cuba by the National Network, and something we really see as a path forward as a region towards making biodigesters a more everyday phenomenon. As Jaime mentioned, in Bolivia, the national level program, which began in 2007, lasted for six years, was much more focused on adapting the technology to an unfriendly climate, on figuring out ways to use tubular digesters, use low-cost digesters in very cold areas, but with high solar radiation. But because it was only thought of as a almost a research project during certain stages and was only renewed over on six-month periods, it was never thought of as a national level program. And so, as different actors, I mean, please mute your microphone. 
So as the uh, as this program advanced, over 750 digesters were installed, but unfortunately, this didn't reach critical mass, and there's been a limited number of replicas since the end of this program. While these digesters, hmm? excuse me, while these digesters have been very successful and were successful in integrating academia into implementation, the idea and the need to really bring them. Uh, in a way that could be replicated by folks in the field and by local capacity is something was still limited. And finally, in the most uh, outside actor driven experience, Nicaragua was the only country in the region that's had a perhaps a true national level program on the style of Nepal, several countries in Southeast Asia or China. So an attempt by the SNV and HIVO, two actors from uh, the low countries to really take their successful experiences in Africa and in Southeast Asia and bring those national level program uh, implementation ideas to Latin America. Unfortunately, these, uh, this had less success than was initially estimated, right? There were some real uh, issues with A, accessing credit, which is very important to the installation of digesters at any scale, and B, a real problem with adapting the technology. The program initially pushed for the use of fixed dome digesters. And eventually seeing the resistance these generated because they are often up to three times as expensive as they would be to install in Southeast Asia or Africa, the program eventually adapted to using the tubular di digesters that are much more common in the region. However, in addition to that flexibility, that, that eventual willingness to change, it was a real success in terms of using the national level program to promote mid-sized digesters, digesters at productive scale, and to promote a market for the use of accessories and the use of biogas using machinery for digesters that are now not just for a, a handful of pigs, but for a farmer that has different economic possibilities and a different ability to use that gas for things that can have added benefit or value add for their farm. So as you see, this is one of the previous digesters installed in Nicaragua, one of the fixed domes. And this program really is something that, that has led to a lot of reflection on how national level programs instituted throughout the region may be more successful. So as both Mariel and Jaime mentioned, the regional strategies, more South-South multidisciplinary collaboration, using actors from various countries to collaborate both within the Red Biolac and in projects um, outside of it. The idea to have both national level programs, but also grassroots democratic efforts to create capacity even when there's not Inability, as we saw at the COP25, to create policy that may really drive adoption. The idea that we need to make biodigesters a much more everyday phenomenon, and that begins with education at the elementary high school level. And finally, to have public policies that enable the use of biodigesters without becoming overly constricting of either implementers or innovation that may occur in the sector. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Sam. This was um, a rapid um, description of all the developments in the re uh, latest years. And um, yeah, it was impressive to see how different the developments have been and um, interesting to hear. Um, and I'd like to ask again the audience uh, to ask questions directly in the chat. We are collecting um, them all. So I'm sure there's a lot more um, to say. And um, I would like to start now the third and fourth poll. Um, so the third uh, poll um, is now starting. Um, so we would like to uh, ask the relevance of biodigesters in, in your current profession. So the question is in you so we have started it is it a high relation medium no relevance so far yeah and we see that you are replying very good you wait a bit longer interesting to see already the results so yeah we come now to an end and see that all of you have um, no there is 18 uh, percent that have no relevance but but interested um, a high share also marginal so only 
a few of you are already um, dealing with biodigesters in your current profession. So we are um, happy to see this, that you can also learn from um, the different presentations. So we like to directly go to the fourth, fourth question and um, ask you where you see the greatest need and potential for this kind of exchange of experiences that is done also by the, the network, but that is also promoted by other organizations. So do you see the need for further exchange rather in, in technical research and innovation and in strategies for promotion, other kind of exchange that we have listed here? application in farming, for example. So we wait for your validation. It's more and more uh, voting, a little bit more, and then we come up with the results now. So the results show that you think the strategies okay it was multiple um, uh, choice uh, and so the strategies for promotion as well as application in farming system is seen as, as quite important but also training and education as well as um, governance and national policies are considered as important um, technical research um, by 25 percent so yeah i think you're this is this is a good overview, and we all know that there is a lot of more exchange needed. So this is also what we try to do, and the network tries to do. So I like to hand over now to Willington, who has been sitting here and also writing down his um, ideas and questions while listening to the interesting presentations. So Wellington, are you there? Yeah, thank you, Carmen, and, and also welcome all of you. Um, thank you to uh, Mariela, Jaime, and Sam for this um, very difficult task of making that kind of overview of the many things that have been happening in Latin America regarding the biodigestion technology. So I, I'm very happy that, that uh, to have you here and have the possibility to discuss a little bit. So I, I would like to make some very general questions. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, start with Mariela. So we have heard uh, about the great diversity of experiences and initiatives in the in applic uh, the application of the biodigesters in the whole region. So we, we see from all of you this great diversity of, of, of knowledge and experiences. And um, it seems that this is a great potential for, for accelerating innovation and diffusion. And could, can you a bit illustrate with one or two examples how the network is building or promoting um, this, this innovation potential uh, by connecting people? So that seems to be one of the main objectives of the, of the network. Yeah, indeed. Actually, it's a, it's a very interesting question, which uh, we can every year answer by listening and understanding the, the opinion of the people and the participants of our yearly event through our surveys. And uh, I think it's quite relevant that we have along the year many online webinars where people get to know a little bit uh, about the technology uh, and through all of our products online. but most relevant and uh, quite important in order to make the network to work is to have also in-person activities and therefore uh, we have been discussing how to manage to actually um, organize and keep on doing every year an event because it's a lot of work it's a lot of resources and so on but uh, without that yearly in-person uh, meeting we wouldn't achieve to create the synergies and the personal linkage and the trust that you need in order to put people to work together and to encourage and to motivate the people to commit to uh, create but also share and that's the only way we have been seen results uh, exchange of different approaches and views and so on so that people 
when come together, always um, come up with new ideas and with no, new projects and so on. Yeah, thank you, Mariela. Yeah, uh, that's um, that's a very interesting. Probably also for for our audience to know how this work, you know, this this um, this need for both like uh, physical, let's say, uh, exchange to come coming together. How how important that is, but also to having this um, in between online and different kinds of of communication, like you like you uh, stressed in your presentation. Um, mm -hmm. Jaime, um, one, one question for you just to, to get, because uh, you already showed us that the plastic tubular design is very flexible and adaptable, and, and you, you, you pointed at, at, at some very interesting uh, uh, qualities uh, for, even for responding to different kind of of conditions and needs, can you tell us a bit more about the the actual use, the actual usage of the biodigester, or in other way, what kind of benefits uh, do farmers or or other users can draw from from the biodigesters? Because it seems to be very multiple. Jaime, hello, yes, yeah, do we hear you? Yeah, okay. Can you? Um, now, as I told you, uh, what we find is that most of the people is, is looking for productive biogas. How to use the biogas in the in the farm, to run a motor, to uh, a pump, or to heat water for industrial purposes. So it's more a productive biogas uh, uh, system. And also we find uh, the interest in the effluent, in the effluent as, as fertilizer. Also we find that uh, there are big, very big uh, farms uh, that produce, for, for example, only flowers, that they, they are very interested in the effluent, to use the effluent as fertilizer for, for their, their, their flowers. No? So I think the, uh, the way it's going, the digesters, is for productive biogas and to, uh, for the use of the effluent as fertilizer. And here, in, the, uh, in this point in the effluent, we need more research because that is a, a real new world. No? We, we, we know a lot about, about the biogas and how to use the, bio, the biogas, but there is much to do in the, in the use of the effluent as, as fertilizer. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, very interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, that's also my impression when, when uh, uh, attending to the uh, conferences of, of Red Biolac, that's, um, that sometimes even the, the focus is not only on the biogas. And, and you are all, always or very often talking about biodigesters and not only biogas. So, but, mm -hmm. but let, me, let me jump to Sam, uh, because we, we learned that, that biodigesters can help in addressing different challenges. Uh, of family farmers or, 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 or other populations. So it is not only biogas or the, the fertilizer, as uh, um, Jaime pointed, but it's also the possibility to clean wastewaters, um, to make the treatment of residues. With all these great possibilities, one will expect that promoting the diffusion of the technology will be easy. But but seems not to be the case. So how 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 to explain this kind of paradox? Like having something which seems to be very beneficial in multiple ways, and mm -hmm. it seems to be difficult to promote. Absolutely. So biogas and biodigesters, really, which is the perhaps the more accurate way to talk about it, are have such transcendent benefits. It's it's a curse in some ways when you begin to talk with national level actors, with government, right? There are a multitude of different focuses or foci that you can look at it from. It can come from agriculture. It can come, as you mentioned, from environmental uh, protection. It can come from energy generation. And so a number of actors or a number of what tend to be ministries have a, an interest in, in potentially participating but no one has clear dominance in the field. And so trying to find an entity willing to lead at a national level is often quite difficult. And 
agencies will tend to sort of kick the uh, kick the issue around, trying to find where it best fits or fight for uh, prominence, perhaps. And this leads to, of course, a lack of coordination in the field. And in many cases, we've seen that that can be uh, very damaging to the success of a biodigester program at a national level. Right? This is not not the easiest technology to implement just because it does have so many potential benefits and so that it really needs to be thought out in a, a careful holistic manner and trying to get that thinking across to um entities that may be an easy win a difficult sell and so trying to figure out why why we push this from a grassroots level is partially because you can have an understanding that's much more based on an individual farm level that's more much more based on on your own felt reality rather than trying to uh, implement it from a top-down way in which it may run into far more barriers or may run into other actors less interested in collaborating yeah that's uh, that's definitely a very challenging um, perspectives and and Probably this diversity of of um, of conditions in Latin America is quite a, an interesting experimenting field for different approaches. That that's, that seems to be the, the case that uh, that you you showed how different are the approaches in in different countries. I would like to bring some of the, uh, your questions from the audience, which are very also very interesting. Some probably to Jaime one. A couple which are uh, more on the technical things. Um, Jaime uh, Antoinette uh, asked about um, the water supply um, and if we have or if you have some uh, experiences on, on this and how to, to deal with the water supply um, in regions with lack of water and directly probably to that, um, related to that is also how is the management of the effluence if you are uh, reusing or, or if you have some experiences from Latin America reusing the water from the effluence. Jaime, could you, I think you can help us a bit on that water issues from your experience or you have seen in Latin America. Okay. Uh... It's true that uh, these kind of digesters need more water than the Chinese model. But uh, when we work in places that uh, they are not going to have enough water during some, during some months along the year, what they can do, the user, is to recirculate the effluent. So he used the, the effluent to load again, to feed the, the digester, using the effluent as water. And this can be done during three, four, five months, usually enough to, to wait to the next rainy season. So to, to recirculate the effluent is one of the alternatives. And now we are working to how how to we are researching how to deal with to to reduce the water use of the of the digesters, but actually. We, we, we haven't got a consolidated uh, proposal. And what we do with the, with the effluent, uh, you can recirculate it uh, to, to avoid the, the dry station, but uh, usually they use the effluent uh, just in the, in the crops. They, they use it as, as water. You have to think that the effluent in this kind of digesters are very diluted. So you have a lot of water and just a few nutrients in this effluent. Um, so we use like uh, just just for the for the crops. Just for, um, I know how to say in English. Uh, like you, for, for the irrigation of the of the farm. Mm -hmm. the irrigation of the of the crops. Sometimes there are people who use uh, 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 sorry, I don't know how to say uh, how to say in English, but most of the people are using just for irrigation the crops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th uh, thank you, uh, Jaime. Um, there is also one question, which probably uh, Mariela can can help a bit on that. Is uh, for you will be probably easy to to refer to that. 
um, one of our uh, audience asks for manuals, how to make these uh, uh, types of the biodigester, if there is some guidance or manuals, how, what will you be your, your response, Mariela? Yeah, thank you, Wellington. Indeed, we have uh, already on our library um, uh, a few amount of documents on, on different things like technical backgrounds, reports, uh, forecasts, and these kind of things. Um, we are actually working on, on setting up next year a uh, Biogas Wiki in Spanish, where we will better organize and complete um, the the topics that we have there, but also the number of uh, publications. The main idea is also to uh, build up a collaborative library so that uh, the community can really uh, put their, their words and their experience and exchange and promote all their technical information um, when it comes, for instance, to illustrations for children, for educational purposes, all kind of information are useful for everybody, for all the practitioners. And uh, this was something that 10 years ago, ago was diff difficult to find because everything was mostly in English and also based on somewhere else out outside Latin America. But we have managed to, to bridge that gap. And um, we are also planning slowly, also giving give a little bit of more relevance to the fixed stone biogas plants as we had this year in Cuba, a very interesting exchange of that um, model, so to say. The um, national movement of biogas users in Cuba have an amazing experience of decades of uh, implementation with a, a very um, successful scheme. And they have also very generous um, act, uh, activists and uh, experts and so you will find more and more more information on our website. So I, I forgot to mention that this question came from Nigeria. So um, to Omar, there are a lot of resources and manuals in the in, um, in the Red Biolac website, uh, but all of them in Spanish. That will be the the the, the, the difficulty probably. I would like to make a question to Sam. You you mentioned Sam and and also also Jaime mentioned it that uh, making uh, training of of uh, building these kind of biodigesters is ra rather easier than than other kind of designs. I know you have some experiences in Ecuador making series of of trainings and, and and training and education is one of the of the main purposes of, of the Red Biolac. But Sam, can you probably talk a little bit of your experience of how are these workshops, these training workshops built? Of course. So just to step back a little bit to the previous question, there are also materials online uh, in English. We can also provide some from Green Empowerment on the construction of tubular biodigesters. And we're working now with Jaime to develop an English language translation of his recent manual. So we hope to be able to share that through the Red Biolac um, within the next year. In terms of the training courses, what we've really seen has been important is that yes, that you can get the uh, the basics, both in terms of calculations, design of these digesters, and the hands-on experience over a period of perhaps three days. This is um, These are courses where we've brought together a real variety of actors, both folks from academia, folks from smallholders organizations, and so uh, of a wide variety of prior experiences. So adapting the curricula to really um, meet everyone's needs has been a challenge, but somewhere we've really seen that going for the basic and going for the most practical aspects is really what's what's most important and what is a shared need. And that what we've also um, is not just an initial workshop, but going back to the same site with those same participants and doing follow-up in a participatory manner is really important so that people don't uh, leave these workshops with the idea that this might all be um, oversimplified, that this all might be easy and they can just drop digesters off wherever they see it. that this is a technology that does have some social complications. 
and then doing that follow up as a group, like coming back to the same sites and talking to the biodigester user about the challenges they face and about the uses they may be making of both the effluent fertilizer and the biogas is a powerful additional tool to really deepen people's understanding of how to successfully implement the technology. So thank you for the first for the for the uh, news about the translation of of, of the manual. Um, that will be really great. And thanks for for um, for sharing this this experience. And I I guess this uh, uh, topic of following up of of um, coming back to uh, to the people, users or installers and like strengthening the capacity seems to have or has been one of the of the big lessons since uh, Red Biolac started probably. Um, I have uh, now a couple of technical questions probably Jaime can help us here. Um, the question is, uh, do you implement uh, or do you use raw, raw biogas or how, how do you clean that, um, the biogas in the units for small scale projects? Jaime, can you give us a very short uh, um, response on that? In a small project, uh, usually we only use um, iron, iron just to clean the oxido, um, I don't know how to say, oxido, oxido, Please help in English, Sam. How you say oxide in English? How? Iron oxide. Okay. You use that? <laughs> Iron <laughs> just, in, uh, just to clean the, the biogas. But what we find is that in very small, in household uh, scale units, the families, um, they finally don't use any kind of filter. They just use the raw biogas in, for cooking and, and that's all. When you cook with the biogas, when you burn the biogas, the, the biogas lost the, this odor, no? this smells, but the smells that it has. So, and, and they don't mind that uh, for, for these uh, smells. So usually only we use uh, this kind of filter with uh, iron, and in, in, in very small scale, uh, nobody use uh, nothing, any filter. Okay, yeah, thank you. That was the question for the small scale. Of course, for medium scales, there are other solutions, more probably market-based, I mean? Yes. Yes, uh, if you are working in a medium scale, you produce, I don't know, 10, uh, 10 cubic meters of biogas per day, uh, and you are using it in, in motors or generators, it, there are uh, commercial solutions to filter the, the biogas. This is for, for the medium scale. No? Thank you. We have now a, a question from one friend, uh, which is making a very difficult question. So I will, this will be probably the, the last question. And, uh, Joaquin is saying, so around the world, biogas doesn't seem to take off. It's like a marginal technology. In most cases, it's successful only through subsidies. Why do you think is that the case? So, because we have seen also in Latin America, at least at that small, medium scale, that subsidies are very important. So, what, what, why is that the case? That is, um, that is so a niche market um, and. Following that question, what do you see will be the future of biogas in Latin America? So I will really like probably Mariela first and then Jaime and Sam, some of your last thoughts about it very quickly. Sure, thanks. Uh, an interesting question, definitely. And um, I, agree. I, I wish with this COP25, we would have had a better commitment from politicians because uh, by not having really that support, it's uh, kind of dif difficult on that uh, p politic level, right? On the technical side, I would say um, biogas plants are often, not always, tailored made. And also people tend to forget that it's a biogas plant, it's kind of an, an stomach of an animal, that it needs daily attention, that you need to know mechanical, electrical, sometimes when, when it goes to a bigger scale, um, but also biochemical um, information. It's 
kind of difficult to uh, bring that information to the ground and to put it simple to everybody. And it's not just a PV, a solar a, a PV panel, right? Where you can just install it and let it work and have a, a little maintenance or observation. A biogas plant, it's a technology that needs uh, motivated people, needs uh, practitioners that are really um, accompanying the users into many years in order to have successful stories. And therefore, I insist it's quite relevant to have more um, advocacy on public policy so that we can really focus and support the development of small and productive scale biogas plants in Latin America. And uh, otherwise, we won't have the development or the deployment that PV or, or wind or uh, big scale uh, technologies had. They actually also started like that many years ago. And also we can see that in Asia specifically, they, they, there are many organizations in, in implementing interesting schemes and uh, it's quite relevant to learn from those schemes and always you have to bring together many actors and this is always very difficult. This is my opinion. Thank you, Mariela. Yeah, uh, you bring this uh, interesting, several interesting points. I would just want to raise one, this, uh, you mentioned the, the biodigester is like an, an organism, and this is definitely something that is probably difficult to trans, trans uh, to transfer to others. That is require a lot of operation and maintenance. And thank you for for that comment, Jaime. What would be your 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 thoughts about these challenges? Okay, uh, I think that the for the medium farmers, medium scale farmers, they pay for the biodigesters. They don't need subsidies, they don't need help because the digesters uh, are a solution for them. Usually they have problems with the wastewater from the pigs or the cows. So they put digesters and, and, and they have a, a solution. But what happens uh, with the small farmers, the very small farmers? Uh, they, they don't have enough money usually to pay for a digester, for a small digester. So we need uh, subsidies to, to, to make the technology uh, accessible, accessible for, for them. So for medium and, and big uh, scale, the technology do need uh, subsidies because it works. It, it is a solution. People of this kind of scales can pay for it. But the problem is the, the small farmers. Uh, they, they they need help uh, to access to this technology because when we work with uh, very small uh, farmers, we see that the impact that the digester can have in their lives or in the in the farm, in the production in the farm, uh, is very very high. And sometimes we find that people who began with a, a digester. Later, they become uh, a much uh, stronger farmer uh, with more economy, with better life, uh, better, better life. So, but the problem is how to begin, how to introduce for them the digestion in their, in their farm. So at the beginning, they need help. Thank you, Jaime. I, I just, it's very interesting what you say. I, I just want to translate a bit from my perspective. So you you bring this idea that some for, for medium size uh, farmers there are problems which are already monetary cost. I think this yes. is a very interesting point eh? that that for most of them uh, this is already a cost which is in monetary terms. But yeah. the improvements in the in small farming that's not directly translate into into incomes or increasing monetary so this very high better farmers is not necessarily more money so it's a very interesting point sam uh, can you have a very sh short uh, idea from from your side sure i would focus on the the cultural and the structural aspects right that it's not just for small holding farmers, it's not just about lack of financial possibility, it's a lack of access to credit. And it's um, in many cases that they're accustomed to subsidy programs. So getting people over that barrier to, to their thinking is much higher. 
and that while there may be economic benefits for smallholders that are very, very much there, they're not immediately felt. So unlike solar, unlike other technologies, it's a much larger change that it requires in terms of the thinking, especially for a smallholder to adopt a biodigester versus other renewable energy technologies. So between the need for that major shift in, in culture and the need for access of credit, I think real limitation to the, the expansion of digesters without subsidies. Thank you, Sam. That's uh, definitely another very important aspect, which is uh, this, you, you mentioned less, or your, your term was like larger chains of changes. It's not only one at once, but it's a lot of causalities, let's say. Thank you, all of you. And Carmen, your... Yeah. Um, thank you, Wellington. Uh, it was a great discussion and uh, and very interesting. And I think we could keep on for hours because uh, this is touching upon several aspects like the challenges as well as the technologies that you addressed. And um, there were several questions raised to that. So we hope that this is not the only webinar. It's just a start where we can give insight on the network and all the experiences. Um, the good thing is we learned that there is a lot of material online where you can, if you're a Spanish speaking person, you can find them on the Red Biolag website that we have uh, shared with you in the chat. And there is also several experiences on, on the, all the projects of green empowerment and also other material to be found on the green empowerment website. And of course, on, on Vision's webpage, we also have our success stories and experiences with biogas technology. Uh, for the ones who can um, understand Spanish, in two days, there's going to be the next uh, Red Biolag specific um, webinar on quality control in biogas laboratories. So if you would like to um, uh, have um, to join this, please register on the website of Red Biolag. So um, for me, um, the, I, I need to, um, I cannot sum, sum up because there were so many interesting things already um, presented. So I'd like to thank um, everybody who um, joined, especially all the three panelists. And I also want to um, thank very much uh, Willington who guided us through the, the discussion. Um, so we wish you all um, a nice afternoon, a good um, end of the year. And uh, for the next webinar, please uh, subscribe to our newsletter so that you're always informed when we will have the next one in the coming year. And now um, we will close this, but there will come up some questions and evaluation and uh, also questions which topics you would like um, to hear from us. So I'd like you all to um, join and uh, fill out the evaluation. Thank you very much.